Appreciate welcome, that. welcome, welcome, everybody. All my friends out Do there in the Gail Burton community and everywhere. Thank you so much for joining us. I have a special treat for you here today. My friends and the library's friends, our robotic expert, our favorite robotics team in the whole world, Got Robot. And they are here to show you some awesome things and tell you a little bit more about themselves and their program. So while I want you guys to join us, make sure that you're asking questions in chat but keep yourselves on mute if you could. And then when the time comes to ask questions, you can ask them in chat, or you can use that thumbs up or that raise hand icon so that we can go ahead and have you ask your question on your mic, okay? But first we're gonna let them take it away and let them tell us all about the things that they do. Thank you guys for joining us. Hi, Charlotte. Hi, my name is Charlotte. You're joining us in our HQ in downtown Elgin. We are Got Robot. Um, you might notice that throughout the time we might have our masks off, um, but that is when we are social. We are practicing social distancing, and it is safe for everyone as we are still following COVID guidelines. Um, I will start off with Aiden, and he will talk about why we are here. Yeah. So my name is Aiden, and I'm just going to talk to you about a brief history of our team. So our team started 14 years ago as FLL team. So we made robots out of Legos. And uh, then we switched to an FTC team when the original kids that were part of the team got too old to be part of FLL. Um, some of the things that we try to focus on is to teach kids real life skills that they can take into the engineering field when they're older. And just to have fun overall when we're building robots, because no one wants to go to a club just to not have fun. And there's also, so like I said, we're an FTC team. So that means that we're middle school through high school and we build robots that are a bit more advanced than what the FLL teams will do. And they build robots out of Lego kits and that's from fourth grade to eighth grade. So all of this is part of FIRST, which is an organization that has over 4,000 teams worldwide and it reaches kids from ages five to 18. Thank you. All right, hi, my name is Evan. Uh, I've been on the team for six years, or this will be my sixth year on the team. Um, I'm gonna be talking to you about our prototyping. So uh, the basics of prototyping consist of brainstorming um, and then the prototyping itself. And then after that, it goes into the design. That's just the basic engineering process for our uh, building and designing of a robot. In brainstorming, um, it's very good to lay out a goal and that way you can properly address problems that you come across. And that way you also can make sure it fits into the right rules and regulations. Instead of like coming up with a quick idea, you're coming up with an idea that fits in certain boxes that you created and checks like all those boxes. Hold on. And then you wanna confirm it with the team and make sure that that's a good idea that everybody's agreed with. Um, when it comes to prototyping itself, it's a quick build design that showcases what you build, what your build's going to consist of, its features, and answers any types of questions that it comes up with. And that way, um, it can kind of build confidence in that design. And then that we use then to help clarify the final design, which will be used in CAD, which Paul will talk to you about. All right, so you might be asking yourself, what did Evan just say? CAD stands for Computer Aided Design, which is basically a form, it's a software that we use to completely design uh, basically, basically anything you want. This robot you see right here, we built completely on the computer before we even touched the machine to start making parts. So the reason we use CAD is because it streams on, it streamlines the whole process of building the robot. Um, we're able to fit things very closely together. We're able to put different parts together in the software to create different sub-assemblies. And then we use those sub-assemblies, like let's say just the chassis of this robot or just an arm. We can put all of those together in a main assembly and then create our entire robot file in CAD. And the reason, one of the reasons that CAD is so useful for us specifically is because since we have to come up with, build, design, and then manufacture 
all of our parts for our robot. Um, it also assists with, um, you probably built things with instruction manuals. So CAD is one of the ways that we can kind of come up with that. We create drawings, which are basically like an instructions from a Lego kit, let's say. And we're able to put this robot together seamlessly and uh, very quickly and all the parts end up fitting together perfectly. So the part of the building process um, is a CAD is a huge part of that building process, which Luke is gonna tell you more about that. So after we finish, after we finish designing our robot, we then need to manufacture it. We first create drawings like this, which are like instructions to show us how to make each of the different parts. And to do that, we head to our lovely mentor's shop that he lets us use some of the machines at. Which uh, include things like mills and different saws, band saws, and uh, drills. Well, somebody's screen share. There we go. Okay. Go ahead, Luke. Okay, so technical difficulties. Um, after we design our robot in CAD, we create drawings like this one to show uh, our team members when we're making the parts, how to make them, like an instruct, like instructions. And to make our parts, we head to our mentor shop that he uh, thankfully lets us use the machines at. Uh, includes things like mills, saws, different drills and things. These are just smaller versions of what we get to use over there. Um, and that helps us create really nice parts like this, which are uh, really nice. Like this mill is useful because you can move it up and down, back and forth, side to side. And uh, that can help us drill really precise holes to make sure that uh, it's represent perfect. Now, a lot of teams don't have access to these machines and a great alternative to that is kits. Now you can buy kits that include parts like these. And when you wanna make your robot, you can just screw them together. And uh, it's a great way to build a robot, but we like to machine our parts because well, uh, it looks really nice. It's very precise and durable, but also you have a lot more freedom when designing because you don't have to work around these specific uh, pre-built stuff. You can make whatever you want. And after we machine all of our parts, we can assemble them into a robot. And uh, another way we make parts is with 3D printing, with, which Josh will now talk about. Okay, so one, in addition to what Luke was talking about, we also use 3D printing to manufacture parts. So if you look at these robots here, any part that's green or black or any color other than silver is most likely a 3D printed part. And so the reason that we like to use 3D printed parts is because we can make a lot of different shapes that are very complicated or unique and you wouldn't be able to make on normal machine tools. So if we go over to the 3D printers, we have a couple examples of parts that uh, we have 3D printed for past robots. And they're actually very nice because they can be very complicated shapes or they can be very simple, but they can all be made uh, passively with these machines. So this is a 3D printer and we have a couple example parts that we 3D printed. So this is, this is one part that we 3D printed. Um, and that's a part that we're currently using on the robot this year. Uh, this is an example of a more complicated print. It's a wheel that has multiple different prints that are all assembled together. Um, so you can see there's a lot of different 3D printed parts that were all put together. Here's an example of how 3D printing can be used recreationally. So this is just a little figurine that was 3D printed. And this is obviously not something we would put on a robot, but it's another example of how 3D printing is used. Here's another part that's obviously a lot bigger that we used on a robot this year. And so for that, you obviously need printers that are bigger than these, but we have access to those as well. And so 
about programming our robot. All right, so to get this robot from a piece of metal that's generally useless, you actually have to program it. Design, uh, wire, and put a little logic, electricity, and maybe a little bit of computer magic into it. So our programming process goes through many different stages. We first start out with a prototype bot, which we call our programming bot. This is a simple, mostly just wheel chassis, um, chassis robot that has very simple mechanisms and moving parts and possibly prototypes that we developed earlier in the season on it. Um, this robot will sometimes go into competition for our earlier qualifiers and league meets um, because those are sometimes only one or two months from when we get the actual game. So we don't have time to design, fully develop and build the final robot like we have here. This is about four to five months worth of work. Um, so programming bot helps us take that step from nothing to this. Uh, so throughout the game, we have two different periods, autonomous and driver control. Autonomous means the robot fully works on its own with its own sensors, logic, and uh, reasoning. Uh, we have to pre-program it to tell it what to do, and then it can decide on the field in real time how best to execute its own tasks. So this year we had to, for example, detect what uh, which square this duck is on. We do that through a camera up here. This is only one of many sensors that we use on the robot including gyroscopes, color sensors, switches, and many more. This all, all of this allows us to get large amounts of data that the robot is able to interpret and uh, execute on. Um, the programming process does require a lot of trial and error though. And honestly, the best way to do things is to practice and learn from it. Projects like these help me and other programmers on the team develop their own skills. Because without this, um, it's without a project or end goal to work on, it's very hard and easy to get lost um, in a very wide spectrum of things to do. So personally, for me and for many other people that I've seen, the best way to learn skills and develop skills like this is to just jump in and start doing it. So now we'll get to the fun stuff. We'll demo the robot. This year, we have blocks and similar sized balls like these. We have to, the robot has to take blocks from here, the shipping or the freight depot, um, and balance it on these, uh, yeah, oh. hubs, these shipping hubs, sorry. The, they're also only balanced on one point. So a robot could easily unbalance it. This not only descores points for us, but could also potentially knock off some scoring elements. So uh, my teammates will run through a few sites. One thing I want to mention is you guys might be familiar with these. Uh, controllers our robot is actually communicating with this little station here and what we're doing is sending signals to our robot which has a program on it and we're able to control it while we're doing it. So that was a 
that was just one of the many parts of the robot game that we complete, compete in. This, uh, this and having three other teams on the robot or on the field allows us to score points um, throughout a two and a half minute match, which tends to go very quickly. Now, Charlotte will be able to talk about outreach. So robotics is more than just making robots. We have different aspects of robotics aside from the build, such as documentation and making sure that everything is documented and making sure that we're connecting with the community and spreading the message at first. One of the ways we have done that is we have partnered over the years with Gail Board Public Library, which is where we are also hosting this with. Um, one of the things we did was our Give Back 10 initiative, which was a three year, three phase initiative to raise $10,000 to make ste steam kits. <laughs> so these steam kits, there are, are in a bevy of different fields. We have stuff in engineering and um, architecture, some even in code, this one's a coding one. They come with kits on the inside, as well as books. Uh, you can check those out at your library right now, if you'd like. Um, one of the other things that we have done, aside from working with Gail Borden, with outreaches such as that, is during COVID, one of our ways to help uh, keep everyone safe last year was our Got Face Shield initiative in which we printed these 3D printed uh, head parts with the vans, right? Yeah, the vans with a uh, transparency sheet in front. We noticed there was a lack of PPE and our response was to find something simple and easy that we could do and distribute to those as many as possible. We made over 7,300 face shields um, to hospitals, to nursing homes, and just to our local communities as well. You might see some of that. You can visit the website for more information on that. Um, we've also done different outreaches like this, where we are simply, simply talking to the community and teaching you what robotics is, how you can get involved, and what more you can do. Um, we plan to have other outreach events in the future. Um, we also want to get involved. We'll, we'll have more with the library coming up. Um, one of the other ways that we outreach to our community, instead of just with our community, we outreach to professionals. So outreach consists of two things, community and then ways that we can learn from other people. So we sometimes tour uh, other facilities or um, businesses that have that teach us more of the realistic um, applications of robotics in today's world. Um, I think we have some pictures. Did we? Get pictures of Echo? No? Okay. So we just go and we learn from big industries about what they do and we teach them a little more about us. Sometimes when we do that, we get sponsors, which are what help us provide to make such a wonderful space like this that we have been granted to us. Um, we get sponsors sometimes by visiting them and having this, and then sometimes we just get sponsors by people who are wanting to give and want to help fund our mission and first mission to spread the word at first. Um, now I'm going to talk about, no, we have a question. We have a question, yes. So, so we, have we have a question from the Fullers, from the Fullers about, about how long, how long does, does it, it take, take to 3D print just one piece of the robot? Uh, Jess, do you want to take so that So Josh is going to talk about, about that one. one. All right, so our question was, how long does it take to print just one piece of the robot? And this can vary a lot based on size. So for example, this large print is a 44 hour print, but it's a passive process. So you just have to set it up and start it. And then you come back 44 hours later and it's done and ready for you to use. But there's a lot of other parts that takes like 10 minutes, five minutes. We even have some parts that took less than a minute to print. All right, so I was going to say that one of the other ways that we help um, outreach or help our community is we also help some of our other teams. There is an FLL team that also is, which is for the younger generation, that also shares our space with us. Um, and we're going to have, we have two of the mentors with us today that can talk to you a little bit more about what FLL is and um, how they got involved and what they are doing. Okay. Come up front. All right, so FLL, I'm uh, Clint. I'm one of the coaches of FLL. This is Allison. Uh, we've been coaching for four years now. Um, we'll tell you in a minute about how we got into that. So first, I'm going to show you our playing field. So come on over here. 
Um, so FLL is start stands for first Lego league. And um, so Lego, right? You know, it's kind of like almost a universal language for children. Kids know this. This is a way for them to get in. All that metal and machining, that might be intimidating, but a lot of kids can say Lego, I'm in, I'm in for that. They, this is not built from instructions though. They start with a kit and they see things here. You can see this is a table and all these uh, Lego sets here, including here, are ways they can score points. They got two minutes and 30 seconds to do this. None of our kids are here. So me and Alison are gonna talk through this. They're on their off season. They're, you know, they're, they're playing in the snow or something today. So I'll uh, have the privilege of running those things. So I'm gonna show you what the one thing a robot might do right here. Uh, we'll see how it goes. So let's launch this thing. So at the beginning of the season, they get, they get to choose the, how they're gonna build their robot and they get to choose the different attachments that they wanna make for it. That will be the best at accomplishing and scoring, accomplishing the mission to be just scoring points. So here, there's a little piece that goes up mm -hmm. and knocks that bridge down. Um, and also they are not, in, in addition to just building it, they also program the robot. So you can see it was doing a line follow to get over here. Now it's gonna try to pick up gonna, these. I think it's gonna fail. And that just That's goes nice. and shows that these things are challenging. Now I just pulled that down That's, and it's gonna come around. And that's gonna come back. And now the thing about FLO is similar to FTC um, in that we don't have it at the beginning of the FTC, the robot has to do it, the work all by itself. And Come this back robot, home. we can't touch it because if we touch it, it's, you don't score the points. Until it gets, it gets back into the circle, yeah. we can't touch it again. So it's all automated. And so kids um, will uh, program this. And uh, so we don't start with complicated lines of code. Uh, we start with scratch, which is something many kids already know. Um, and it's all little drop, um, placing drop um, blocks, et cetera. And they can do that to tell the robot to move or to listen to a sensor or something like that. Um, so it's a great way for kids to say, hey, I can learn uh, something uh, based on something I already know, Lego. Uh, but that's only one part of First Lego League. So um, I wanted to just say that, uh, from what I understand, we have a question. Excellent. And we have a question, I believe it is, what age or can any kid join Lego? And so FLL is specifically designed for um, kids that from fourth grade to eighth grade. Um, and so anything in there, um, they have the ability to come and join and learn. So, um, pardon? What? Oh yes, if you, if you, wanna, if you want more information, yeah, firstinspires.org, um, I mm -hmm. believe it is, is where you can go and get more information. It tells you about all the different ages um, that are involved and different ages for different, the different levels for different ages, so. And the exciting thing about that is for the team that we focused on, uh, First Tech Challenge, Chat Robot, um, for the children, uh, for the teens, I should say, um, all started out in Lego League. So that's where they got their start. They have uh, uh, between, so each of them had between two and four years on that. Uh, there's a second side to uh, First Lego League. Um, and uh, we've coached kids through several of these things. And that's the project, it's called an innovation project. And so what they'll do is they have to take a problem and then find a solution. Um, this past year's theme was about moving cargo. I mean, if you guys hear about the supply chain crisis, everything, it was, uh, it was along that, those sorts of lines. And uh, so the thing I was most proud about last year um, was the fact that we, uh, our kids chose to do something based in Haiti. Yeah. Um, there was a river. Um, we worked with an organization called Feed My Starving Children. Maybe some of you have heard of that organization. They uh, pack food and send it elsewhere so that people on the ground in these countries can focus on other things. Uh, but uh, that organization told us about this one particular river and there's other spots like this. There was, they literally have to wade through to get the food through them. And so our kids chose, let's work on that. And let's see how we can more easily get food across that. And so they chose a zip line to get across so that they could carry out boxes of food over to those folks. Uh, they even made a Lego model so they could explain it to judges. And it was just a joy to work with uh, the people with Feed by Starving Children. Uh, the kids really enjoyed that one. We have another question. Okay. Um, 
Can kids from other states make teams? Uh, yes. Um, first is um, a nationwide organization and also international. Uh, there are teams in many places around the world. And uh, firstinspires.org is a good place to start for that. Um, I think we're going to be talking about mentoring now, right? Okay, so we'll go to Mr. Clapper. Actually, we have, an, we have another question. Okay. So this is about autonomous. And somebody said autonomous is really cool. So we were going to talk a little bit more about autonomous. Okay. Um, so talk a little bit more about autonomous. I'll uh, run you through what a basic autonomous looks like. The robot starts off with its bit of data. So here, I have a representation of it right here. You see that? Yeah. So right now, it is looking at this duck. It's trying to find how this duck is placed and where it is on the field. That determines um, a randomization that they do at the start of the match that we have no idea. It can be three different uh, three different values. So that determines where the robot will go during its autonomous routine. So it starts off with that. Then to make sure that we are set and ready to go, it will automatically, here, if you wanna come over here, it will automatically reset some of its uh, sensors and motors. So up here, we have what are called micro switches. And one, when the motor hits it, it knows that it's at an exact position and we call that a zero position. That way, when we're going to other positions where we don't know the stuff in the position, we can base it off the relevance from that. The robot also has to know where it is on the field because without that, it's very hard for it to um, navigate and move around. The way we do this through is we have uh, encoders installed on every motor of the robot, on every drive motor. But what is an encoder, you may ask? An encoder counts how many times, not only how many times does the motor uh, revolve or turn, but also increments of how many times it does that. So that means if it only moved a quarter turn, it would tell me, hey, you moved, uh, it counts it in ticks, but you moved so many ticks. That way we can determine um, by doing a little bit of math, we can determine how uh, far the robot has moved um, based off just, just those values. We also end up using a uh, inertial measure, measurement unit, unit or an IMU. This uh, allows us to tell us our heading, based off of when we started um, and our orientation, gravity, and a few other uh, useful data points. So this means we can also find out our orientation. With these two values, our orientation and our distance traveled, we can determine where we are on the robot field at any given point in time. This allows the robot to move uh, to move a specific distance, so we usually use it in centimeters, um, at different times without getting lost or running into other things. Um, um, so throughout the autonomous mission, we have to do a number of things, and autonomous is only 30 seconds of the whole robot game. So it ends up going by fast. The robot has to do things in its most efficient and fastest possible way. Um, so we end up testing each autonomous program over and over and over, trying to find places where we can cut down that time, make it more efficient, and make it more reliable. Reliability and consistency are also extremely important when you're working with machines because they will more or less do the same thing each time. They'll do exact, a machine will do exactly what you tell it to do. But if you tell it to do something wrong, it's gonna do something wrong. So we have to test and make sure that we do not tell it anything wrong 
or um, a faulty sensor, for example, could mess it up. Um, so we have safeguards and fail safes in place so the robot can still function even with uh, errors or malfunctions. Um, okay, now we will have one of our mentors, Mr. Clapridge. Yeah, one more question. One more question. <laughs> Love it. How long does it take to complete an autonomous? How long does it take to complete autonomous? All right, so, or the question was, how long does it take to complete an autonomous? For us to go from um, start of programming to having a finalized autonomous, that takes a couple of months. But once we have the framework in place um, and some of that, like uh, knowing where it is on the field at any given point in time, some of that math and stuff like that figured out and configurations, um, doing what autonomous we have to do. So for each, we have four different positions we can start on during autonomous. Each of those four positions has three different uh, autonomous routines. So there's about 12 autonomous routines we have to do for each game. Um, each one of those routines probably takes uh, about an hour to two hours, um, depending on how com complex it is to uh, actually build and test. Um, but we're always adding on to our autonomouses and making sure they can uh, run their best. All right. Uh, if that's no more questions, we, we can move on to Mr. Clapridge, um, who will talk about being a mentor. Hi, uh, my name is Paul. I'm a mentor. Uh, and you keep hearing a lot of people mentioning FIRST Robotics, and that is the organization that Got Robot is part of. Um, and FIRST has a mission. It, it's not just about kids building robots. Uh, the, the organization on purpose has something really cool, like a robot to, to get kids interested in. And through the process of building that robot, they learn skills that they can use for the rest of their life. So our, our team is kind of like any other varsity sports team. Uh, the game we play is what the robot plays, but we have to build that robot. And uh, I'm a mentor here uh, for the same reason that every football team has a coach, every baseball team has a manager. Um, we're here to help the kids learn how to play the game well, how to, how to build robots. So uh, how I got started was my son was on the team and I'd come to pick them up and see what they were doing. And we'd go to the competitions and, and watch the robots run. And through that, I realized that, that the mission that the organization set out to do was actually impressive and really coming true. The kids were learning things like the, well, the whole engineering process, which uh, you know, everybody doesn't was just born knowing that you understand the problem, you brainstorm a solution, you um, prototype the solution that you think is going to work to see if it does. Then you build your final product and you program it, you test it, and then you compete with it. So that whole process um, is the process that I, I help mentor the, the engineering part of it. So uh, I help them learn how to use CAD because uh, that's what I do for a living. So that's easy for me. Um, I just, I, I get the easy job. I get to help them do things that I know how to do. So um, help them with learn to use the CAD system. Then I help them learn how do you cut metal? How do you cut plastic? They actually taught me how to use a 3D printer. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, which I use at work now. That's even cooler. Um, I, you know, we can actually use it sometimes. Um, so that, that in a nutshell is, uh, is I became a mentor because I was really impressed with the organization, the quality uh, of things that the children were learning. And I thought, wow, I, I have something to offer here. I, I would go to football games, but when, uh, when my children were involved, but I didn't have anything to offer because I'm not really a football kind of guy, but I like building machines. That's fun for me. Um, but in mentoring, uh, on a team, it's not only engineering. There's a lot of different kind of mentoring that goes on. There's uh, mentors that help the kids connect with the community, uh, outreach, we call it. 
um, mentors that help with management skills, organizational skills, um, public relations, uh, there's uh, social media, all, all kinds of everything that goes into making any organization run has to happen for our organization to run. And it requires adults who uh, want to give back um, to, to kids, you know, what, what they've received in life. And it feels good to give it back. Questions. Okay. What are the requirements of a mentor? Do they have to have a STEM background? Yeah, you need anybody can mentor. If you've seen Ratatouille, anyone can cook. Um, <laughs> so, really, you I think um, you just have to have the willingness to help. Uh, if you you come to the team and see what feels good uh, and see what task is easy for you to help with. Uh, but you don't have to have any particular, there's no, there's, it's just like a soccer team or, or, or a baseball team or whatever, you know, moms and dads come and the guy's like, Hey, I used to pitch. I know how to do that. I can help teach the kids. I know how to catch, you know, I'll rake the field. I know how to do that. It, it's all uh, a team effort on the part of the parents uh, and adults. They're not always parents um, that are involved. So that. With that said, um, the next. Another question about programming. Okay, <laughs> I want to talk about programming and then we can pass you off on to a, another mentor. So uh, Raymond's going to answer that, right? Thank you, Raymond. All right, so we had a question about what programming language do we use? This year, we primarily use Java. Um, that's the short answer. In past years, we've also used a language called Kotlin, which is primarily for Android phones. Um, we've also used C++ and C. Uh, these control hubs, or the brains, as we call it, um, are what actually runs the program. They run on a version of Android OS, which means uh, that we program using a um, it's like an app, but it's called an IDE or an integrated development environment um, called Android Studio. This allows us to send code that we write from the computer to our um, to our robot. Um, yeah, uh, we also uh, have used different elements like we've used a camera before that's had a uh, different APIs and we've had to use some like Python scripting, but the majority of the code right now is in Java. Um, I hope that answered the question of what programming language do we use for FTC. Uh, next, we will have, oh, we have another question that Paul will be answering. Yes. <laughs> okay. So one of the questions was, what are some of the steps that we take uh, before a competition like to prepare? So we're actually gonna have one next weekend. So what we're doing right now is we're actually preparing a lot of different aspects of the game. So there's the obviously the gameplay, which is with the robot. We're making sure everything on the robot is completely sound. Everything works. We've uh, stress tested things, tightened screws, made sure our wires are connected, wires don't get caught on anything. There's so much stuff that goes into the robot. Another way that we prepare for competition is actually uh, there's a part of the game uh, where we get judged. We give a presentation to a, um, a bunch of judges and we have to uh, explain to them how our season went. So we actually prepare for a long time before competition on what we're going to say, why we believe we're the strongest in this category, how um, we went about things during the season. And you know, like why we are a good robotics team. Um, another way we prepare is we pack things up. So we get our materials ready for competition. We're always ready. We're always expecting the robot to break because it does happen at the worst times. So we'll bring tools, materials, extra parts, stuff like that. Kind of like how you would prepare for like, uh, I mean, I guess robotics competition. You have to be ready for everything. So yeah, we never, we always make sure we cover every little thing um, from our shoelaces to like the screw on this little part. We always write for that. Um, Paul, what part or what parts of the game 
during the competition do we know about like what is definite what do we not know the, the day of okay. things like that so yeah obviously we do know like what the game we're playing is but we don't know um who our teammates are going to be during the game we don't know what's going to happen with their robots and ours because there's a lot of crossing of playing on the field so what we have to do at competition to prepare for the game is we have to do a lot of collaboration with other teams so we'll uh during the autonomous period when our drivers are not controlling the robot there's four robots on the field and if you're not careful there's going to be collisions and we want to avoid that completely so we're gonna to have to discuss with the other team before we play the game, um, where does your robot go? What does it do? How can we work together to get the most amount of points out of this game? And how can we like, what strategy do we need to score the most points? So that's one thing we don't know that we have to figure out. Um, does that answer the question? Okay. Uh, now we're gonna hand it off to Mr. Salve. Oh, hello, my name is Mark Solomon. I'm an engineer, have been one for over four decades now. And I've been involved with, with uh, first all levels of it, FLL, FTC and FRC. We haven't mentioned much of FRC. That's for the high school students only. It doesn't allow the middle school kids in it. Um, FLL, you're playing with Lego parts. This is something, as one of the mentors said, that every kid's played with at some time in their life. It's something welcoming and easy for them to start with. Um, FTC, we're getting a bit older of a group involved. Um, Whether eighth grade to seventh grade to, 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 to the age of 18. And um, they get more flexibility on what they build with and uh, more demands on what the robot needs to do. The, the, the competition's a bit harder. Uh, whereas on a FLL field, you'll be the only robot on the field. As, as, as was mentioned earlier on FTC, you're paired with another team and their robot and you're playing against two other teams and their robots. So there's four robots on that 12 by 12 field, all competing at the same time. So I think that answers the question. Oh, why am I a mentor? I've been a volunteer and a mentor. Well, let's go with volunteer for 16 years now and a mentor for, for about 13 of those years. Um, and over the same amount of time, I've gone back to volunteering quite a bit. I am on the first tech challenge state planning team. I'm on the state championship planning team. I help run their website, firstillinoisrobotics.org. And I do this because as an engineer, this is a way for me to give back, to make a better world for the future. Uh, I don't want to get into the politics of it, but we have a lot of engineers that come from other countries to work in the United States because we're not producing enough engineers of our own. Um, and so this is this is fun with the mission. This is fun with, 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 with a purpose. These kids learn how to be engineers, how to be um, project designers, they, 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 they learn how to be part of a team and it's a sport. So they're having fun. And it's the only sport I know of where every person who plays in this sport can become a professional. So. Mr. Solomon, we have another question. Okay. Are there college teams or a way for college students to be involved? Well, we have a lot of college students, uh, mainly alumni of the program, but others who are just interested in robotics, who um, get involved as volunteers at the events. Um, I'll be judging at an event tomorrow in Deerfield. This team will be competing in Rockfield, uh, Rockford next Saturday. Um, so there's events you can attend. Um, 
actually double check that because some of the events are now not allowing because of the pandemic uh, visitors, but I think they're live streaming all these events now. Um, as for colleges, I know some colleges that have their own robotics teams. Uh, some of them are working more with the drones, the flying robots, um, and competing with those. And so there are things out there. I'm not an expert on it, so I'm the one person to answer the question. But I have met a couple of people who, who a couple of college students who are so involved. I, I know one college student who's graduated, who's now uh, a mentor for a team in Chicago. And he led a whole robotics program at his college, uh, uh, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and, and their whole robotics club got started because of one person who loved robotics and, and, and got involved in it. Uh, so these things do happen. Uh, any other questions or should we pass this on? Um, we have a question that Josh is gonna answer. Okay, I'll let Josh take it. Okay, so the question is if we have traveled out of state for competitions. So we actually have our team over the course of the years has competed in nine different states. Um, and this is including uh, the world competition. So you go to competitions that increase in difficulty from a regional qualifier to a state competition. And then from the state, you can qualify for Worlds. So Worlds moves around, um, but at the world competition, you're versing teams from all over the country and all over the world. So we've played with teams from different countries like India or a lot of different European countries. Um, and once you go to Worlds, the competition gets a lot more difficult and you start seeing a lot of ideas that are very unique since um, obviously different regions kind of develop different ways to play the game. So here are a couple trophies uh, that we've gotten at competitions. Well, these are from um, different places. And so, yeah, these are all from different places. So for example, this is from a super regional, which we played in Iowa. Uh, this one is from a state competition that we played in Wisconsin. Uh, and then this one here is from the world championship, which we actually did in St. Louis. Uh, so we play in a lot of different states uh, against a lot of diff people from different states. Um, so yeah, I think that answers the question. Yeah. Oh, and uh, so we're going to pass it off to There's one more. There's, one more oh, there's another awesome. question. Have you ever gone or won worlds? It's not <laughs> the Olympics. Oh, okay. yeah. So so we've gone to worlds. I think our team has six times. Um, we've qualified for worlds. I've personally been to a world competition twice while I've been on the team. Um, and the best our team has done was 2015, I think. We got second place at worlds, uh, which is this one, this trophy, second place at Worlds. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so. Oh yeah, so we're gonna pass it off to Mr. Birch. My name is Mark Burridge and I'm not an engineer. And I'm not a programmer, but I did go to programming school when they still use punch cards. So uh, if you can put that together, you'll know how old I am. Um, the reason I'm here is uh, it's it's very fulfilling and um, it's it's easy to do. I know you heard a lot of information from Raymond and Paul and Josh talking about programming and 3D printing and CAD and um, but that doesn't mean you still can't be involved. Um, if you, like Mr. Clappridge said, if you, have a, if you have a heart and you have a desire to help kids, um, you can be involved in this on a daily basis. Um, um, like I said, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a programmer, but um, I, I help to try and lead these kids to do better each day and to be more organized. And uh, it also helps me trying to be more organized. So. Um, it's, it's a great thing. Um, if you want to get involved again, um, reach out to us through our website or reach out to first.org, um, firstinspires.org, and you can get some information, but, um, yeah, it's, it's a very rewarding experience. Um, it's great for the kids. It's great for you and, uh, it keeps you young. So thank you very much for all your time. Um, we'll, we'll keep on the chat to see if there's any additional questions coming through. Yes. And um, I hear we have some. So uh, we'll. 
for you, you can answer you and another student. How much of a commitment is it for kids or mentors? Do players do other activities? Okay, um, for mentors, I mean, I, I feel it's, it's not a huge commitment. We meet regularly. Um, two nights a week when it gets closer to competitions, it pushes into three nights a week um, or th th two nights a week and a Saturday. So, you know, it's just a few hours, but uh, the, the um, reward that it gets, gets um, for the kids is great. And um, who wants to talk? Raymond, you want to talk about it? Raymond does some outside activities also. So, um, you know, we t do tend to have lives outside of robotics, even though it doesn't feel that way sometimes. Um, <laughs> our team on average spends usually around eight or 10 hours each week um, during the regular season uh, at practices, building, programming, um, doing drive practice. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, <laughs> And just, you know, having our practices. Um, but during, uh, once we're gearing up towards the competition, like we have one in a week, uh, we start to meet more often, have more days, have more hours um, added on to that. But like, for example, I do uh, track at school and that is a full-time sport. I'm there every six days a week um, for a couple of hours a day. And um, most of us are uh, honors and AP students um, that end up having pretty good amount of homework at night. Um, so we, we do have other extracurriculars outside of robotics. It doesn't, take a, it doesn't take all of our time, but it can take a majority of our time. And that's not how all teams work though. And uh, some members spend less time on it, some spend more. Um, depends on the time of year, what they have going on in their lives. Um, there's also some school teams that we know that only are able to spend um, less than a, or like a couple of hours per week. Um, so they don't have as big of a commitment as we do. So it can vary uh, very often. But personally for us, we found that we have time for other commitments. Um, okay, we got some more questions. Okay. Okay. So I really was just going to talk and go back to the question about how much commitment for mentors. So in terms of mentoring, you have a couple options. You can be a coach. So as a, as a coach, they're here regularly throughout the season, um, throughout the week. Um, there are some people who are mentors for the team who come in to help out with special activities, or maybe they have a couple hours here and there to give. So um, I know there are a couple of us who um, help this team out, but we may show up for like an hour or two a week, every other week. And um, so it's kind of um, based on what your level of commitment, where you want to be. Um, and it, I have no technical experience either. Um, and so it's kind of a matter of what you, there's so many different activities that you can help with. You can help with project management. You can help with writing. You can help with um, marketing. So um, there's just a lot of different ways to be involved. It does not all have to just be the robot in the room. What Lego question? Oh yes, we've got a, we've got a question. Go ahead. Uh, does Lego provide the Lego scrubbers? Okay. Yes. So I. Do you have to buy them or fundraise? So yes. Um, for FLL, um, everyone is um, required to buy the same mat. Um, and the, the, you saw the, the field, so that everyone is competing with the exact same, um, the exact same thing. And then they have the opportunity to build their robot to meet those missions. I think that's how they score the points and the difference between the teams. Um, the teams are required to buy that. Um, so I'm trying to think, is it like $150, 200 how much is it, $300? Uh, which part? The, 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 the table. The uh, I think it's only about uh, 90 or $100 for the table. Okay. But, uh, but you know, there's team fees for yes. the competitions. Yeah. yeah, so there's other things, but yeah, um, and there's there's no um, there's no rules as to how you want to get the money. We, I know um, our team has done fundraising before, um, so um, sometimes you can use just team fees. Everyone kind of chips in a certain amount to help pay for um, the cost and spread it across the whole team. So, 
the robot um, kit costs about three fifty. We might need a few extra parts for like a. And there's grants available. Yeah. Grants. Yes. There's grants available. Yeah. A lot of stuff can be reused. Uh, yes. Here. So there are grants sure. available, and as a former FLL member mentioned, um, parts get to be re to get to be reused each year. So you buy the mat, but you get to keep all those pieces. Yeah. So those get to be incorporated into your future robot and into your attachment. So. Um, you just kind of keep building each year. So somebody wants to see the Lego robot again. Cool. That was cool. Uh, yeah, that was hey, cool. Uh, Can you guys read <laughs> that? I'm going to turn it on for these because these two haven't run this one before. And uh, for them, get it rolling. Uh, so, our, uh, let's give them a good, let's give them a close up first of what the robot looks like. Uh, yeah, why don't you go ahead and do that. So here's what the robot looks like. Now check this out. Um, now, go for it. Um, so this is our robot, it has many Legos, Legos are cool. Um, this back here, this yellow and white brick back here is the brain of the robot. This does all the programming, holds the information and runs it, provides the power, have wires over the motors. We've got motors here, 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 and over here uh, that you know, run all the attachments and stuff. And many teams do this many different ways. We actually like to have a modular system that goes on quickly because you know, have to uh, swap your attachments uh, quickly while you're running. Another one. Pull it off. What? Oh. Pull it off. Like that. Taylor, this year um, our team opted to make a modular design so that this was a base piece. This is our, our brick and our main robot. And then all the attachments that we would need to complete these missions, we added on to sort of these frames that would have different um, different pieces and things so that it could uh, uh, do different things on the on the table. So, I don't know if you want to show them a different one. Yeah, another one. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Several and different options. This one's pretty cool. Uh, the robot goes out here, and we actually have some sensors like this measures distance. And we have color sensors here that can sense color. And we use them actually with uh, some programming to follow these lines and do different stuff with that. And then this, we have a thing where turn this and it drops the piece of brick off and you can drive away. So there's lots of different ways you can score and many different challenges you have to solve each year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A whole table full of them. A whole table. And honestly, I don't, I think most teams ever get to do all of them at one time because you have to kind of pick and choose because there's so much to try to do each year. Yep. So yeah, briefly. Yeah. Okay. Did you want to see that see the robot in in action? Yeah, should we do it one more time in action? What all are right. we gonna try to do? Um I think I don't I don't yeah, I think we better just do the same one okay. again because I have a that's <laughs> The kids who ran these um, are, are not here. Are not here. Um, some of these, these, some of these gentlemen around me were in it in past years, but they went up to the uh, first tech challenge yes. uh, because they wanted a new challenge. And uh, so I will stand in for our excellent fourth through eighth graders. I'm trying to figure out how to, 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 go to get this launched, uh, but they didn't. I didn't program this. No, they, they did. Um, um, and they built all this, they came up with the ideas, they discussed it, et cetera. So um, I think we're all set up again, so we'll see if this works well. So you'll notice that it's gonna, if it catches a line, it's gonna follow this line. It's gonna try to push this to connect here. Here it goes. It's down the line. We're gonna use this little thing off to the side to push this and connect it here. Then they're gonna try points. to use, get points, and then they're gonna knock it down one direction. Uh -oh. Oh, one thing was out of the lap, so yeah. we'll try it again. 
All right, so being not professionals like the children, I forgot a step. Um, and one little thing was off. So one tiny little thing like that. So it really helps them think through that because this was out there, it caught there. And so it really helps them, you know, think through things. It's a, a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of pressure in the best possible way for the kids, um, which, you know, just prepares them for things in life, which I'm always excited about. And we'll give it another try. Just thanks for sticking around. So, okay. That side. Move that one to the truck. It's going to uh, come back and then push down the other side of the bridge. So it's going to continue to follow. So the goal with these two is to try to pick up these from, from these two places. So it's going to hopefully lower down and if it's aimed correctly, catch them, yes. lift them up. Then it's going to come here and knock this bridge, like connect this bridge. Then it's going to come over here and drop one of these gray blocks that we showed you earlier into this. And so each of these are things that score points. And now he's going to try to get all the way back home without us touching it. Brought a friend along. <laughs> and there it goes. And then the team, with, if they have less time left, two and a half minutes, I think that round goes about a minute, uh, would have a chance to take this off and down. then put a new attachment on. And then they were going to run to another part of the field. And the kind of cool thing about this is at this kind of ties into our project, the whole field and all the missions are, you know, related to the project. And if you're ever struggling with some ideas, you can look at the field and get some inspiration. I think it's really cool to design that. Yes, there's been times where a uh, field element here will uh, help, um, just like Luke said, help uh, inspire some thought in the real world. Well, uh, thanks for checking out FLL. Great yeah. question. Yeah, and I think we're going to go back over there. I think there's a uh, First, let me leave. We had one more question about um, how does one go about starting a team or joining one? Um, so the easiest way is to either visit firstinspires.org or firstillinoisrobotics.org. There, they have tons of different ways um, they have different places there that you can go and look at how to, you, have, you can connect with other people, professionals. Um, another way that you can think about joining or um, finding a team or starting one, you can contact us. You can contact us through our website, gotrobot.us. I'm pretty sure all three links are um, on, in, the, in the chat. So you should be able to see those. Um, so contact us, we'll get you connected with people. Um, it will help you start a team if you want to. Uh, also, the first inspires um, dot org as well as first Illinois Robotics. Those places are valuable, valuable resources that um, are really great to take advantage of. They have everything you need to know um, and all the steps you need to take. <laughs> is that all the questions? That is all the questions. We have a, people saying thank you. You mm -hmm. guys are great. This is really cool. <laughs> Thank you for listening and thank you for tuning in and spending your time around. This is our team. <laughs> thank you so much, Matt Robot.